I think we're good there. And I'll go to the chat. All right. Ah, good. The correct number of people are in the chat. <laughs> well, the stream just started like a second ago. Keep All it right. this way. All right. Got that going. Got that pause. I got my eye over there. Maybe I'll open it up over here and they'll be... All right. Let's make sure I muted the... Yep, I muted all that nonsense. Desktop audio. That's what I had to mute. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's Monday, June 25th, 2018. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, SQL and relational databases. Because in 13 years, I guess we never talked about this. <laughs> all right. So I think we got a, at least temporarily a new bit in the show in the beginning. Because you know the format of Geek Nights, like we do our opening bit where we're like, oh, it's warm today, rained on me, I ate a taco last night, and we do news, we do things, that, things of the day, then we do our meta stuff, then we do the main show, and then we do like the stinger nonsense. I got a new bit, the PUBG moment. Cause we're Shouldn't we just do, we're going to do Tuesday on PUBG, might as well just hold it. So I, I'm going to just tell one PUBG story, because I've been playing a lot of PUBG. Uh -huh. So my story is how I indirectly killed a guy in a way that was so funny that I was laughing, and because I was laughing, someone else killed me. Mm -hmm. So I started in like the upper right corner of this map, and the circle, of course, is as far away as possible. Right, time to run. Yep, and I'm at this like little tiny town that's on a road. There's no vehicles at all. Like I figure there's no way to run there in time. So I'm looking for a vehicle. I confirm there are no vehicles anywhere near me, except one. So I decide to run toward this next little town and hope there's one there. And if not, I was just going to die. But then I hear a noise, and a dune buggy is driving from even further away, coming into town. So I take a couple of pot shots, and this, uh, this individual, instead of just driving by like a smart person, right, sees Right, because me. you'll die from the wall, they, you know, but they guess they want to get a kill. Yep. So uh, they they stop and get out and start stalking me what? through this Why town. Why would you do that? So the circle is coming. So I take a couple more pot shots and then I hide and I keep sne I sneak around away from this guy and eventually I have a clear shot toward his dune buggy. So I just ran for it mm -hmm. and he didn't see me and I got in the dune buggy and just as I start driving away I hear a ton of gunfire and he is behind me running and just emptying his clip and missing mm -hmm. and I left him behind. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Because well, you don't get credit idiot. for that kill, even though it's you should. The yeah, I should. Has, the game has no way of knowing that you killed that person with the wall. But I the was wall gets credit. I was so happy about this that I was just sort of holding down on the road and laughing. So and that, then, that didn't actually count as a kill on your stats. No, so. no, no, no. Okay. I did kill two other people Whoa. in unrelated incidents, which Whoa. is a big step up. I think, so you've killed three people. So I've killed three people in so this game. that's a total of two more people than I have killed. <laughs> we got to play some more. Maybe I, I should just play after I eat tonight. I'll go home, I'll eat, and then I'll just play until I kill someone, no matter how long that takes, even if I don't go to work tomorrow. Maybe when we team up again, our new goal should just be our only goal is to kill someone, and we don't care if we make it past that point. Yeah, their, their teammate can kill us. We're okay with that. Yep, we just got to kill one. All right, so it's a tech day. It's not uh, if we somehow kill two, we'll be like, Woo! <laughs> <laughs> and then some sniper will be like, "What are those guys jumping around for?" Badoop. <laughs> Who are they teabagging? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, got any news on this glorious Monday? There's not a lot of Monday news, but I got this one. So this is actually a pretty big deal. I don't know. It's not that big a deal. Adobe is always if you go look at it. You know, people always pay attention to Apple and Microsoft and whatever, right? But when Adobe announces stuff, they usually announce these ridiculous features, uh, usually that make it to Photoshop way after they announce them, or other software like Premiere. I remember when I was watching an Adobe thing a few years ago, and they were announcing the ability in like Premiere, you could like draw around a license plate in a video on one frame and to blur it out, and that it would automatically follow that license plate in all the other frames of the video and blur it out, so you wouldn't have to like go to every single frame and blur. Yep. And I was like, that's really amazing that they did that. And that was years ago. So a new thing that they, uh, they announced is, of course, the people who made Photoshop can do this, right? Technology that can tell when something's been Photoshopped and which parts of the image have been Photoshopped. Now, this is actually... So now you no longer have to be able, like, I see the pixels. It, as soon as this software becomes available for public use, there'll be some tools, and you could just load in and be like, yep, this tool says this was likely Photoshopped. 
the reason this is so important is that the Adobe tools and in general media creation tools, there's sort of this, there's an ethical dilemma where if you make certain kinds of editing too good and too accessible, it makes it very easy to make convincing fakes that can, uh, as we saw in the 2016 election, really damage society. There's a lot of, uh, and the technology of making fakes, you know, there was that fake porn thing recently, yep. right, where they put celebrities' faces onto porn actors. Or even more, what about the, the audition stuff where you could theoretically have audio of someone and just change one of the words they said. It t- sounds totally natural. Yep. Now, normal person thinks, oh, I will use that to correct when I mispronounce that word in my podcast. But uh, expanding brain person says, I will just use that to get people to say things they didn't say and then sue them over it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so the tech- the ethical thing to do expanding, is to also create... Expanding, expanding super mega brain person says, I'll pretend I used that technology when I didn't. Yep. <laughs> but... The ethics of that kind of technology... I will say bad things and then claim that someone used that technology to make me say bad things I mean, when I didn't. How many conservatives are doing that now, but I didn't tweet that. Someone hacked my account. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but the because there's been a lot of problems lately with technology being used to harm society in very direct ways, the, the ethical thing to do is as you design technology that obviously has possible nefarious uses is to... Also design, at the same time, the technology to mitigate that damage. If you're going to be a mad scientist who invents a poison, but that poison also cures a disease and doesn't kill people who have the disease, so we need to make this poison, you should also make the antidote for that poison in case someone gives it to someone who doesn't have the disease and they're dying, right? To just make the poison only would be bad. Mad scientist shit. Yep. Also, don't be like a cartoon mad scientist where no one can get the antidote. You should make the antidote more plentiful than the poison. So <laughs> if, anyone, if anyone accidentally, you know. Well, it, don't be a super villain is really the answer. You can be a mad scientist, but the situation Scott described starts edging into mad scientist super villain. What mad scientists are not super villains? I imagine there's some okay mad scientists. They're just mad. They're not good. They make like an apple replicator that just makes more apples and that's it. That's not mad. That's just a That's kind of mad. What that's do you what do you need that for? Apples for feeding, li- feeding the world? Apples literally grow on trees. We have more food and more apples than we know what to do with. No, there's a lot of people who are hungry. Yeah, that's a distribution problem, not a production problem. Yeah, but what if we we can't put an apple tree where they live because it's not fertile, but we can put an apple machine where they well, live. Well, also apples are not enough to live on by themselves. Better than starving. Contrary to the Disney cartoon about Johnny Appleseed, apples are not alone able to sustain you. They'll keep you going long enough that you can grow something else. Maybe. <laughs> and you eat some apples, you won't be dying of hunger immediately, so now you can go to Maslow's Hierarchy's next level and start making a farm. So in some actually pretty related news, there's some facial recognition company and the CEO made an interesting argument. Oh, I saw this. He basically said, and I'm going to cluster I'm a bunch... I'm the CEO of a facial recognition company. I know all about this technology. Yep, but <laughs> Trust what I have to say about it. There's a bunch of stories around facial recognition recently again, but this was pretty interesting because the, the, the head of this company basically said... Law enforcement should not be allowed to use facial recognition because of the technology's built-in biases and uh, vulnerability to abuse. Mm -hmm. So he's sort of making this argument that commercial or even surveillance capitalist uses are probably okay, or at least... They're neutral because they have both benefits and harms to society, but using them for government or law enforcement purposes is way more dangerous than it is valuable. All right, I'm going to make an argument, but you have to promise that you will not start discussing this argument. You will just hear the argument and the question I'm going to make and not answer it because it will take you hours. Okay, in return, we should do either a Monday or a Thursday show in the future on the tech transfer questions around facial recognition. No, this is a different question, but uh, it's not a tangent. I'm just saying, <laughs> to get my promise to not turn this into an argument, you got to give me this show at some <laughs> point in all 2018. Right. Here you have a person. And you heard deep, Scott said, all right. And this person owns a company, and they are declining to serve customers based on the industry that they are coming from. All right. right? right. So we obviously think this is okay. 
Yeah. And we think it is not okay to decline to serve customers because they are a g- certain color, gender, sexuality. Okay, I'm curious where you're going with this. I won't start the argument, but I'm just going to point out that uh, there's a very obvious and clear line if where you're going is where I think you're going. So what if someone were to do both? What if a gun store refused to sell guns to white people because, but used this argument instead of a discrimination reason? Ah, Or so a religious freedom reason? Law and precedent aside. Why are you answering the question you promised not to answer? I'm not going to argue it. <laughs> That's the end. Go and move to the next topic. Okay. I'll just let it be. <laughs> I got things to say. <laughs> I I will hold up to my bargain. I'll just I'll keep it in. I'll keep it in. It's hard, isn't it? <gasps> so my tantalizing question. In some <laughs> other news that won't start an argument. So I saw this trending all over the place, and it won't affect me because I'm gonna buy a 4K monitor. Because I gotta buy a new monitor. But what's wrong with your monitor? Oh, uh, the, the other one. The yeah, one that, the one that's that one. The one that's 16, 17 years old. That one. Also, this I one. That, I think I bought that in two thousand two. Also, three. this monitor. The only reason it looks okay is I've turned the brightness way up. This monitor is real old and real dim. I was actually watching on YouTube. Um, it was some people who. It was like people recording a radio show, but they were also just live streaming them sitting in the radio studio at around yeah. the table with microphones. <coughs> They had that monitor, the Samsung 17 2X. Wow. But, uh, Hmm. Scott, this monitor is from, I think I bought this in 2007, this old Dell UltraSharp. What? That's the same UltraSharp I got, right? Yeah. The U2410. Yeah. This is like the best 1600 by 1200 monitor you can get. Yep, but I want a higher resolution monitor now for modern uses. Well, they're all 16x9. I know. I'm going to... I have to give up on 16 by 10 even though it is the superior aspect ratio. Why? Just stick with lower resolution. Uh, cause I also Why need... Why do you need so many K's for? I do need... I need more P's. You don't need more P's. I need a few more P's. I don't need... I, you know what? I, I've got... I've got two of those monitors, right? On my desk. And you know what? I'm planning to keep them for another... Until, like, everything is 4K. Like, all the videos... Oh, I'm real... It's because I edit a lot of video, more P's would make it easier. But I'm gonna I'd take this monitor... i buy a 4K TV before I buy a 4K monitor. But also, I'm gonna take this monitor turn it sideways, stick it here, and take this old Samsung monitor and give it its proper Viking burial because this thing is too old to suffer. Still works. Like, Someone can use it. Yeah, Scott, the brightness is turned all the way up and colors just don't appear. I see colors. I yeah. see blue, green, there, red, there, white, there, yeah, there are still some colors on this some monitor. orange on there. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> Black. But anyway, here's the problem. So the with L, with LCD monitors, you never want to run the monitor in a resolution that is different from its native resolution. I don't want to get into why, because... Right, there's always some other way. Like, for example, if I am playing a game and I need to be 1080p, right, for streaming purposes, I won't change the monitor to be 1080p. I'll just get the game to run in 1080p full screen so there's black pixels at the top and bottom. Yeah, there's ways to get around it, but it's old monitors actually did have variable resolution. Like, pixels could be smaller and it would be fine, but CRTs are ancient technology. We don't need to talk about them. Mm -hmm. In the modern world, with an LCD, if the resolution that your video card is sending to the monitor is not its native resolution, meaning one LCD pixel equals one computer pixel, your monitor is going to look like shit. Well, you could use a resolution of the same aspect ratio, and then it would still be one-to-one pixels. You would just have a lot of pixels that weren't doing anything. Yeah, well, the, so the, well, yes. If you also, if it's if it downscales and you have a lot of blank space around it, exactly. You, or there'll be a setting in your monitor for like stretch or no stretch. You never want to stretch. But the other problem is that even if you do that, yeah, it would be fine. But then you're just wasting a whole chunk of your monitor. Obviously. But even if you do some perfect aspect ratio, like every four pixels in a square would be the equivalent no, of no, one no. pixel. No, no, no. It has to be one to one. The resolution you're right. Yep. One pixel of the actual, the one physical pixel needs to represent one pixel in the frame buffer. Yeah. What I was getting to is that that still is not good. So what's happening now? Kind this happened the, a while ago where suddenly everyone was making these 1920 by 20, 1080 panels, and that's why monitors have gotten to the weird place they are today, because it's cheaper for manufacturers of the core components to make the same thing over and over. So it costs pretty much the same in the modern era to make a 2560 by 1440 panel as it does to make a 4K panel. So what some companies appear to be doing now when they sell a 1440p monitor is they just put a 4K panel in it and lock the firmware into downscaling. 
Mm-hmm. So the moral is either don't buy 1440p monitors well, or buy, only buy a monitor from a high quality that you know is a high quality model that is the uh, advertised yeah, resolution. Yeah. Or if you want if you actually want to buy a 1440p resolution monitor, you need to do your research to confirm that the monitor you're buying has a physical native resolution of 1440p. Cuz if it's a 4K panel in there, your monitor's going to look like shit yeah, I mean, and you probably can't easily hack that firmware to use the rest of those I'm pixels. sure someone will, but the point is uh, at the at, you know especially at the prospect of being able to get a 4K monitor for much less than a 4K price, someone will find a way to hack that firmware. But yeah, this is why on monitors I never skimp. I always tell people, you know, get the fancy IPS screen, get the, you know, go all out, get the ultra sharp. Don't get that shit oh crap model. Get the fancy model because monitors matter a lot. That's the part of the computer actually that's going into your eyes. You're using it the most. It matter. You're better off getting a better monitor than a better CPU or a better video. Well, like at my old job, I had a generic 1080p. The and mouse, that was keyboard, and monitor are the three most important things. Kind of like the computer chair. Yeah. But when I had that Gennaro 1080p like monitor at work, the problem was as soon as I go into Photoshop or InDesign to make something, something will look fine because I just can't see the full color gamut. And then I look at it on a real monitor later or I print it and it looks like Garbo. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, I think that's enough news. I don't care enough about Star TLS to talk about it. But anyway, things of the day. What do you got for me? I see two videos so these here. These two videos go with each other. One video is actually, they're from the same channel, and one of them is linked as the top comment on the other one. But all right, you got, all right. We're going to provide both links to make life easy for you. So here's the deal, right? There's a lot of you react videos all over YouTube. That's a big trend. And it started off as like those kids react things, and it was sort of just like, lol, watch people's you know, emotional face reactions when they see things or yep. like have kids use old computers, lol, right? They're usually utterly painful to watch. Yes, but now there's actually this new genre of React video. I don't it's not that new, but I'm actually way into it because what it is, it's have person who is expert react to thing and inform you about it, right? So Ooh. you sort of So for example, this one there's like this really good K pop channel, it's React to the K, where there's a bunch of students who are students at the Eastman School of Music at U of R. And they watch, they're, they're classical trained musicians, right? A- attending like basically a conservatory that's relatively highbrow, right? It's not as fancy as the one in New York, but it's still, it's still highbrow. Right? Uh-huh. And they're watching K pop videos, <laughs> right? And being like, oh, do you see the pentatonic thing they did there? <laughs> right? So here what, we have. What, what, what does pentatonic mean, Scott? I have no fucking clue. Okay, just saying. Move and carry on. <laughs> just making uh, sure. Anyway, I just know it's a music <laughs> word. So the uh, here. Right, is a same genre of video. We have three Marios, not Marios, but they're chefs from Italy from high fancy Italian restaurants in Rome, right? And they're watching the top five most viewed YouTube videos about how to make carbonara. And they are judging the people who are, you know, eat, including one famous chef. Right, they're judging these people, and they're like, "Oh, what do you put in the garlic? Oh, you don't put garlic <laughs> in there." Oh. Right, uh, and then the other video is they show you how they make it, right, uh, the right way. So it's really fascinating to see them, you know, like actual Italian chefs p- go to celebrity chef and be like, "Oh, what are you doing? You don't know how to make that. What's wrong with you?" <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that also shows, like, you know. You can't always trust the most viewed thing on Professor U, right? Oh, my God. You know what? I, 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 I could have gone to YouTube and searched for, like, how to make carbonara, and, and the top five videos are all wrong. I got to find this I want to make this, this happen. I want to get some filthy casual to, like, who's good and like you. Like, I'd like to see a speedrunner of Mega Man 2 watch you play Mega Man and a speedrunner of Bionic Commando watch me play Bionic Commando I and mean, just commentate. Like, I'm like not, but see, the thing is, I don't play Mega Man 2 in a speedrun way. I play in a... In a, when I play Mega Man 2, I play in a way that's safe, where I know that I can get Marathon really far safe. and have a high chance of beating the game without dying. Yeah, and Marathon, I'm not, I'm not exactly in a hurry, right? It's like I get to a hard jump. I'll stay there. I'll get ready. Think about it. You know, like in Mario, if like, oh, there's a big jump coming. All right, let's get ready. Let's get in the right position. Okay, go. Right? Yeah. I won't just be like, go, 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 except it's level one. Then I go, 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 because right? it's so easy. So my thing of the day, and uh, before you ask, because Scott asked when I said this is my thing of the day, if, the, if this lock is easily defeated, 
The answer is clearly yes, because otherwise it wouldn't be my thing of the day. Okay, so it's so an easily defeatable lock. There's this fancy $100 smart lock, and it's a padlock, but it's not like a online Internet of Things smart lock. It so doesn't you, can't, you can't hack it with some Wi-Fi. You can't hack it with some Wi-Fi or anything. It just, it, it's just a computer inside of it. Yep, instead of having a combination or a key... It just has a fingerprint reader, and you can program different fingerprints into it. And the fingerprint reader not only is super reliable, and they couldn't easily defeat it, but even if they scratch the shit out of it, it still works fine. Mm. Like, they scratch the shit out of the reader, it still unlocks only when the right person tries to unlock it. Oh, so the actual fingerprint memory and record detection technology was actually very high quality. Yep, that's not the vulnerability. I'm sure it's not 100% foolproof, but it's very good. So... The problem with this lock... That actually sounds really useful as like a good lock. You can't yeah. forget your combination. You can't forget your key. I'd be very inclined to get this. Cause right. it, is the lock like actually physically secure as well as as good as any other padlock in terms of, you know, like being damaged by like a hammer? So it or, is in the sense that uh, physically to, to like break it, it would require big old bolt cutters. Right. So the same as any other equivalent lock. Except for one... You're basically one, paying extra for this convenience. Except right. for one fatal flaw. Okay. So I can hack this thing... In 30 seconds. Oh, no. So it turns off. It turns out that the back of it... Does it have a battery or something that runs out? Well, it has a battery, but if the battery runs out, you just can't unlock it. Oh, that sucks. The battery seems to last for fucking ever. It's like this giant lithium-ion battery that's just in it. All right. But the back looks like it's steel. You can't just break into it. If you just put a suction thing on the back of this lock and twist it, the whole back just comes off. And, and what's then... Un what's under there? Uh, four Phillips head screws... And if you remove those, because the back that you twist off is how you replace the battery. And then if you just open that back, take the battery out, and open the four Phillips head screws, uh, you can just physically open the lock by tugging on a thing inside of it, and you're done. Uh. So you can just take the back off the lock. <laughs> Once again, tech bros like to design technological solutions that solve things, but lack the basic domain knowledge of the core area of from which the if problem I'm arises. If a lock that has a battery, right? What you should do is make it so that you can only access the battery compartment if the lock is unlocked. Uh, it's almost like if, if you're lock designing a lo lock, you should talk to someone who is an expert in that. You locks. could have easily made that twisty panel untwistable when the lock was locked with some sort of you know piece of metal in the way. And then make it so that when you unlock the lock, the twisty piece of metal on the back to access the battery compartment is now twisted. Oh my god, so one of the first comments on this YouTube video. Now imagine if someone did this, but instead of stealing stuff, they just removed the battery and closed the lock. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Troll of the century. Well, remove the battery, open the lock, steal the stuff. Then close the lock, yeah. put the lid back on without the battery. <laughs> so now the person's trying to open this lock desperately, right? They finally go and get some bolt cutters or whatever and find a way to open it. And then they open the lock and then everything's gone when they open it. And it's you're already gone, gone with the shit. <laughs> instead of looking for a thief, they tried to fix their lock. They didn't think there was any thief involved. They didn't check any security camera footage because they didn't think anything was stolen. Yeah. And by the time they check it, you're even farther away. That's something I've learned in my entire life, and it's my advice to you if you think you're going to commit a crime. The most important thing to know is how long all the places that have security camera footage from that area actually keep their archives, because usually they don't keep them that long. Nope. You got to time delay the discovery of your crimes, children. Mm -hmm. So, in the meta moment, the book club book, which might be, if it is not, the next Thursday Geek Nights episode, it will definitely be the following Thursday Geek Nights episode, mm. because we will be done within a month reading The Odyssey. I'll have to set a reminder to read it again, because basically I'm, I've only been reading it on my iPhone on the train, and I yep. haven't been taking any trains. But if we go to the beach on Sunday, I'll probably just finish the whole thing laying on the beach. Uh, I'd have to bring a phone. Oh, I guess I'll bring my phone to Yeah, the I'm going to bring my phone. Uh, Phone's know. waterproof. I can just bring it to the beach. Don't or I'd rather just not, or maybe I could just get away with my Y watch only. I, I'm confident we'll do this soon, but uh, we'll start the thread. I'm gonna start poking in the forum thread and tweet and typing up some initial thoughts because uh, I really, really recommend that everyone read this translation of the Odyssey, regardless of whether or not you have read any other translation of the Odyssey. It's great. Mm -hmm. uh, in the rest of the meta moment, the next big convention that we will be performing at is PAX West. Mm -mm. And then PAX Unplugged. Mm -mm. And then after that, I think it's MAGFest. Mm -mm. And hopefully also the uh, Anime NYC. Because mm -mm. I can take the subway to it. 
And I uh, see after Unplugged before Mac this. I don't even know when they all are. All I know is all the panel submission deadlines are like this week, and I'm <laughs> sorting all that stuff out. Mm-hmm. I've submitted a bunch. I haven't run any of them by you for West, but uh, mm. I'm sure it'll be fine. Whatever. I'm putting in a bunch because I figure variety, let them pick. Mm. Anyway, uh, otherwise, uh, I want to call this out again because I've noticed lately a lot of people have been fleeing, uh, in particular, anime forums and tabletop gaming forums. I've seen a lot of Twitter chatter about that. Mm -hmm. And the reason that people are leaving all those forums is because most forums on the internet are full of fucking Nazis these days. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because they have poor moderation, or they worship at the almighty teat of free speech without understanding what that actually entails. Mm -hmm. So I just want to remind all of you that if you're a nerd or geek of some kind, and you're listening to these words... Why would you be... I don't know, but apparently you are. Anyone who's still listening to this episode of Geek Nights this far into it would probably do well to join the Geek Nights community forum because we the only rule we have is you can't be a goddamn Nazi and you can't be annoying. And we don't make a big ceremony about it. Just if someone's shitty, we don't even say anything. We just ban them and they disappear forever and you don't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. So if you want a community of people who are chill to talk about anime or to form gaming groups... I can't think of a better one than our own forum. Like, I'm not even joking. Mm. Board Game Geek doesn't really have the Nazis like a and does, but even then, Board Game Geek, I would not form just, a gaming it, group. I mean, it just has, you know, grognard, misogynist, beer. I guy. would not form a gaming group from the Board Game Geek forum, is all I'm saying. That's right. I would not advertise where at a PAX I am hanging out LFG in that forum. Nope. But I would do that in the Front Row Crew forum, which is... Our forum. Mm -hmm. And also, if you don't feel like you have a lot to contribute, uh, I say join anyway because... You know, people don't realize how many lurkers that forum has. It has a lot of lurkers. Like, it's terrifying. But if you post in the Geek Nights forum... You probably get more readers than your actual blog. A lot of people like use it as their blog and like start a thing. Like, you know, a lot of people have threads that are like only so and so cares, like only Scott cares, and they post about a thing all the time, and even though they're the only one posting in this thread using it like a blog, uh, people are reading it. Yep. I have proof. I mean, I'm just looking at like the uh the things of your day thread has like 35,000 views and like 2,000 posts. Mm-hmm. There's people in here and they're all cool because if they're not cool, Scott or I just ban them and you'll never worry about them again. Mm-hmm. Oh, and uh we're not there obviously, but SGDQ is happening right now. Yep, and I'm just going to watch it all on YouTube as they get uploaded cuz oh, I watch some live action. I've been too busy. I I the nature of having changed jobs is that I do, it's interesting, I do less, like, work. Like, I'm not designing UIs anymore. Like, I'm not, I'm not looking at an API and trying to do a proof of concept. Like, I'm not doing that type of work anymore. But instead, I have to, all my work entails talking to people, talking to people, making PowerPoints, and then presenting them to people, and making decisions. So I don't have as much time to sit at my desk and like idly consume something while I work on something. I spend all my time literally like going to a meeting, being the adult, and after people plead their cases to me for an hour, I say, this is what we're doing, that is the decision, and that's all I had to do. Mm. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to watch YouTube streams instead of the live stream. <laughs> all right. Uh, there will be no board game chat in this episode of Geek Nights, new listener who's hanging out in the stream, because Monday Geek Nights are about neckbeard, grognard, uh, not really grognard, more just neckbeard, uh, computer stuff. Tuesday is at the day you want. And there won't be one tomorrow, there'll be one a week from tomorrow. Because we have lives now, so... And we're I'm, not even talking about board games a week from tomorrow, we're probably gonna do an episode on PUBG. We're probably gonna talk all, all PUBG, because... <laughs> That's our latest obsession. You have to wait for a Tuesday that happens to be a board game Tuesday. But I will say the next board game we're probably going to review on Geek Nights is going to be Azul because it's really good. Isn't and it Azul? Yeah. A-Z-U-L, the board Which game. Which means, doesn't that mean blue in Spanish? Uh, I think so. Yes. Azul. It's, uh, like it's, set, it's set in Moorish Spain and it's about laying t- mosa- tiles and mosaics. Yeah. It's a real good game. Why are people getting in this stream, though? Get out of here. Go do something. No, hang out here. We got five people hanging out. No. Oh, that's, a good, that's a lower number than usual, which is Monday good. always gets the least people. L- Monday gets the most downloads. Yeah, it does. Maybe I, it's because tech people know how to download a podcast. I don't even and know. non-tech people know how to watch a YouTube. I, 
I am really hard pressed to uh, understand. It's four. Someone listen to me. Good job. <laughs> I hope it's the person who was just asking about board games. <laughs> All right. So, uh, yeah, we somehow did an episode on fucking no SQL. Well, because that was the hot thing. It was. It was actually a funny article today. Someone wrote, and they were like, blockchain 2018, no SQL. Yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah that's right. That's accurate. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to talk about relational databases. I don't think we're going to get too... De- like, you're not going to learn from this episode whether or not you should use MySQL or Postgres. As far as you, right, all that matters to you is, as for most people, they're ex- the exact same goddamn thing with slightly different user interface. So, I guess, what is a relational database compared to all the other ways you might store data? We're right. going to start babies first babies and work first. our way So, up. you are going to make some software, right? And you, gotta, you have some data, and you want to store that data somewhere where it doesn't go away when someone closes the program and opens it again. Yep. Now, you could just put it in a fucking file. Yep. If you're using Python, you could just like what pickle.io and there's just a like, lot of there's other ways to put stuff in a file. Yeah, but you but could like serialize it into an object and like write it to a file system somewhere. Right. Like, there are <laughs> a lot of ways to put things in a file, but the problem is when something's in a file, it's not that easy to work with that data, right? It's like you can't easily if you want to search your file for things, or let's say you got like a list of names and you want, you know, it's like that that's hard to do. Well I'll put it this way, the thing that put the data in the file is usually the only thing that can really take the data out of the file. And if there's any question about how you're gonna use that data, the people who wrote the thing that put the data in have to deal with that. So like what if two people are gonna try to write to the file at the same time? You have to what handle if you want, that. What if you want a bunch of different programs to all share the same data and you know, like you've only got one file in the file system. You can like synchronize this file. And, like, what if the data you want to store is four thousand terabytes of data? Right. So this is what a database solves. Now the thing with a relational database, right, is like, well, what's what's relational about it versus other databases? Well, imagine you got yourself a spreadsheet, right? And this spreadsheet has a bunch of columns. Name. Now, spreadsheets already revolutionized like data in the modern world. Right. Like, name, spreadsheets are a big deal. Name, phone number, address, whatever. You know, all the data, right? Uh, and you can search. You got a spreadsheet. Well, spreadsheets you can search. Spreadsheets you can sort. Spreadsheets yep. you can filter. Spreadsheets you can write you can, functions against them you internally. Can make, you can make reports. You can put math in the cells. You can do all kinds of stuff in a spreadsheet. The problem is. If you get lots and lots of data, suddenly spreadsheet gets really, really big. I have a spreadsheet also, on my desktop at work. So I was doing a little, like some really simple data analysis. It has like 900,000 elements in it. Right. Now imagine sometimes, you know, spreadsheet gets lots of redundant data. For example, let's say we were going to make a spreadsheet of uh, game collections, right? Now, it's one thing normally if you're just keeping track of your... <laughs> normally as in normalized versus yeah, denormalized? People who, people who would put a game collection in a spreadsheet are just keeping track of their own game collection. Yep. So they just, they only need one sheet. They could just have, you know, the name of the game, you know, what year it came out, uh, who, who designed the game. Now, this is fine because say if I'm the only one using it, it's just like the file thing we talked about before. Spreadsheet is just fine. But if I change my schema, like I want to add another column, I'm the only one using the spreadsheet anyway. It's not going to break anything because yeah. it's my spreadsheet. I know what I did to the data. Right. And it's only, but now let's say you want to have a website that lets everyone keep track of their game collection. Well, yep. so suddenly you got a spreadsheet, and column one is, you know, name of the game, and column two is name of the person who owns it. All right. So I own a copy of Puerto Rico. Now, Rim also owns a copy of Puerto Rico. So now in the next row, it's like, well, it's Scott Puerto Rico, then it's Rim Puerto Rico. But both Rim and Scott Puerto Rico have to have all the information about Puerto Rico. Right. It's like, well, we're, you know, suddenly it's, it's like Scott, Puerto Rico, made by Andrea Seyfarth, came out in whatever year it was, right? And then suddenly we're repeating all this information about Puerto Rico, and we're repeating all this information about Scott every single freaking time. Well, a relational database is basically a bunch of spreadsheets, except you can link from one spreadsheet to another so we can say scott puerto rico and that puerto rico is actually a link to another spreadsheet that has all the info about games we have one spreadsheet with all the people one spreadsheet with all the games and then we have a table that links the people to the games so now we don't have to repeat ourselves right and if we update say that puerto rico changes its name to a different game we can change that and it changes for everyone we don't have to change it all for everybody we just change it in one place Change for everyone because it's just a link. Now, the right? problem this solves is primarily around data integrity mm-hmm. <laughs> in that now you understand, like you basically put rules around how data is related to other data and you can 
enforce those interactions. You can react to those interactions. You understand them. And you'll never get in a situation where the data gets out of sync. The detriment of doing this is that it does reduce the performance because if I want to do a query against this data now, I have to hit look at all these different tables right, if you want and to use say, the keys right, if you to link to, them together. Right. It's like, oh, I want to get a list. So we've got one table. This is a list of people. When I, one spreadsheet that's all people and one spreadsheet that's all games. And now we want to say, all right, give me a list of every game Scott owns. Well, we got to get the Scott row from the people table. And then we got to look at this other in-between table and figure out, okay, well, which games does Scott own? Get all those from the game table and then mash them together <laughs> into one new spreadsheet, and then we'll actually deliver that. And that takes CPU. The CPU has to do a bunch of work, right? It, normally, if you just had spreadsheets, you wouldn't do any work. You just look at it, right? Now, one reaction to this problem was NoSQL, which we've talked about. Mm -hmm. Another reaction to this problem is you might hear people who are more database y talking about normalizing a database or denormalizing a database. That's just about because you have to make decisions about where are we going to break apart. Sometimes it's obvious people get. Games. So when you're actually doing real world work, it's not so obvious which spreadsheets to make and which ones to link. Yeah, like you might think logically it makes sense to split it up a certain way, but your user might not be a human. Your user might be some UI on a web page somewhere, and the kinds of questions that UI is asking might not map to what you logically think of the data as. So over time, people took this multiple spreadsheet database idea where the sheets linked to each other. They're called tables, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> no one calls them spreadsheets. We're starting babies <laughs> first, but I promise we're going to skip from that to right. the, the modern usage of databases. Right. So here's the modern usage, right? Is basically over time, this basic model of having r tables that link to each other to store your data, they added features. And they added features and they added features and they added features to where no having to manage this software with all these features they have added is a job in and of itself. Yep. Right? I mean, for example, they added indexes. They've added sharding. They've added master-slave configurations and replication. They've added transactionalism, at right. atomic updates. It's like there's just so uh, views and uh, triggers and oh uh, fucking stored procedures. The stored bane procedures. of the bane of my existence a decade right. ago. They've added so many goddamn features to these things. Special kinds of columns that uh, searches. It's like the amount of features that have been added to database. It's, and it, it's good that these features are there because if you're making software that uses one of these databases, you don't need to reinvent the wheel because the database probably already has the feature you want. You don't have to code it again. You don't have to code a search because the database has a search. Yep. You just need had to learn how to access that search function that's already in the database. So without getting into the details of all those things, the real gist of this is that the place you use a relational database today is when you have a large amount of structured data that needs to be accessed by multiple different actors. Well, I mean, even if you're use, just having something that only needs to be accessed by one actor. Oh, yeah, like an have, embedded H2 or if something. If you had structured data, they have a, there's a thing called SQLite, which is a, which is a really, it's, you would not believe how often this thing is used. You, you probably have like 100 instances of it running on your computer. Yep. Like, you don't even know about it. Uh, like every browser uses it to store like your cookies and shit. And like it's everywhere, just hidden. Uh, it's SQLite, and what it does is it runs a relational database inside of a file. And so it lets people who are coding code with SQL just like they're using a relational database, except instead mm -hmm. of having a server and all this multi-user stuff, it just saves the whole database in a file, and it's really small and fast. So if you're ever writing like a game and you want to have a database in the game, and it's just a single-player local game like uh. on a phone or something, use SQLite. Your phone probably has like 100 SQLites running. <laughs> Right. Well, I guess a better question then is, what are, what are the benefits of a relational database overall? Because it mostly comes down to, like we said, data integrity. All right. So the first benefit is basically that it's so used, right? MySQL, Postgres, MSSQL. Yeah. Anyone who knows the basics of technology and has worked in technology knows SQL enough to write a select statement. Right. So SQL is basically this language, the structured query language, and you use it to communicate with these databases. You can use it to make tables, you know, change tables. Now, this is important because in, out, put in theory, in. you can write the same SQL queries against a database. It doesn't matter what the thing is that's querying the database. The idea is that any application, any programming language, you could literally be chiseling ones and zeros onto a stone and then reading them in somehow. 
SQL is SQL. The problem is with a big asterisk at the end of that. Like I've written the same SQL that's worked pretty much exactly the same with Postgres and MySQL. Uh, there's obviously some differences, but MS SQL, I just, I've had to do some of that recently. Yeah. And it's like, I tried to do just select star limit a thousand, which means select everything from this table. Only show me a thousand rows though, in case the table's too big. I don't want to see all the rows. I just want to get a sampling, right? And nope. In Microsoft SQL, it's select top 1000 star from. Now, the way around this in the modern world, if you're doing a big database, really, is that usually your applications especially if it's like a UI in the web or something, they're not like actively making raw SQL queries every time you do something. Usually there's some middle tier in the way that presents APIs, and on the back end of those APIs are well-formatted, highly optimized SQL queries. Yeah. Anyway, so SQL is this language. I highly recommend anyone who does technology work, you should learn it if you don't know it already. Just learn the basics of it. I, I don't care if you just know go, like just guess. how to do a left outer no, no, join. No, just go, go to a terminal, type SQLite. It should show up. It's yeah. almost guaranteed to be installed. If it's not, it should be easy to install. It's free. It's open source. Uh, and then just you know do, I think it's slash question mark to bring up the help or dot yeah. help or something like that to bring up the help. And just start reading and then get a little SQL guide and like a SQL babies first and be, make a table and then like select, fill the table with people like and names and contact info and then like get all the people who live in New York or something like that, right? And just learn the basics. And it, it's really, it's like plain English. It's not something that, It's like select star from cities where right. city select, equals something. Select name phone number from contact info where state equals New York. It, like, you know, that's literally what you type in. And then it will select the names and phone numbers of everyone in that table who lives in New York. Right? Or as yep. New York in the state column. So another big advantage of relational databases is the fact that they you sort of intrinsically set up your cardinality, as in how your different pieces of data relate to each other. This is that question like, well, one Scott can have many games, but many games can only have one Scott. Like those kinds of questions. It forces des your design to address those questions. Right. So as you're designing your database, you know, you answer all these questions. And then when you're actually making your application, your database will prevent you from messing up, right? Yep. Even for things like, okay, I've decided that names of, uh, of these things cannot be longer than 100 characters. So that column in the, in the database only supports 100 characters. And then someone tries to type one in that's 101 characters. They, didn't, they mess up the validation on the, on the form on the website. And someone types in something that's 101, it won't get inserted in the database. There'll be an error. Yep. Right. It, it forces you to stick to all your rules. You, if you make it so that you know each person can only you know own one game, and you try to add another game to a person, it won't let you. <laughs> right. You you know, your data structure is like set in stones. You have all these rules, and you're prevented from breaking them. And that's actually a good thing. Now, one thing that a lot of people seem to mess up is whether just because uh, you have a relational database doesn't mean that it's necessarily ACID compliant. Mm -hmm. And even if that database could be ACID compliant, a lot of default settings will make it not compliant. Yep. So and even when things are ACID compliant, people still have timing issues and stuff. So I had to look it up because I never remember fully what ACID stands for, but I know what uh, it is. Do you remember? Because I just pulled it up. I forgot the what the atomic, I was. Atomic. Yep. Uh. Consistent. Consistent. The I is the one I forgot. Item potent. Uh, isolated. Isolated. <laughs> and durable. And durable. But here's, here's, here's what this comes down to. There's two fundamental ways to set up your database in this regard. So say I am adding Scott to some... Like I'm making a big update where I'm going to add Scott and I'm going to add a bunch of games to Scott. Let's say that in the course of adding Scott, I fail, but then all my things to add games succeed. Mm -mm. Like, I put Scott's name in wrong. So now I've got all these games that I added, but they're referencing a key that doesn't exist. Nope. There's no Scott. That's no good. So atomicity, or at atomic operations, is the idea that you chunk several related op uh, 
operations into one transaction. And if any one of those steps along the way fails, you back out the entire change so you can never get your database into an inconsistent state. Right, you group 100 tr commands together into one big chunk, and it starts doing them in order, but if at any point it fails, it can undo all of them and go back to where Here's it Here's a very practical example. Also, let's say I'm in the middle of doing these 100 things, and I'm like, I'm at number 50, and things are going along nicely, yep. and someone else comes along and does a query, because it's multi-user, right? Yeah. Yep. Someone else comes along and asks the database for something. They won't see any of the 50 things that happened already. Now, there's They're nuance to that. They will not be able to see those changes until they are all done 100% and then they're locked in. And then from then on, anyone who queries will now see all those changes. Yep. Now, that's both isolation and consistency. And actually, the isolation part gets really fascinating. Like, here's a, we'll go a little deeper into how this stuff can Most be Most cool. of these things happen because you have multiple people working on the database. If you ever had multiple people working on a spreadsheet before, we've solved a lot of these problems because you can see whoever else is working on your Google Sheet at the yep. same time with those little colored boxes. But imagine if you're all working in Excel and someone just saves the file. You, someone, you both open a spreadsheet at the same time on your computers. You save it to the shared directory, and then someone else doesn't load in your changes. They just save right over it and blew all your work away. Now, arguably, that was solved by WebDAV, but whoever fucking got WebDAV to work? No, this is, sol <laughs> right, this is why you use a relational database and not a spreadsheet, right? A, yep. Like an Excel spreadsheet. Excel but spreadsheets are for accounting and math. They're not for data. But here's an example of two ways why. to handle that situation, and this is where... I, not every like databases are complex enough now to where if you're going to use one if for real and it's not just like a local tiny embedded database that only your application is using like a real big iron shared database you should have someone on your team who is a database expert because mm -hmm. this stuff gets real complicated in a hurry mm -hmm. so there's there's a bunch of ways to handle that situation where multiple people are working with a database. So one way is locks. Say I am reading it. I have a query. I'm asking the database a question. In the middle, and say my question takes 10 seconds to answer. Well, that's a long time. Yeah. Four seconds <laughs> that's in, a problem. Gonna fix Scott that. tries to make a change to the database. So one way to handle this is that until my, my select query is done, the database tables I'm querying from are locked. Scott's change just gets queued up. He can't make the change till I'm done asking my question. Because mm -hmm. otherwise, I might ask for the 50 states. And it just gives me Rhode Island back. Scott inserts Smarch, and then it gives me Smarch back. And then Scott realizes Smarch was wrong and removes Smarch, and I get more or fewer results than I expected. Mm -hmm. Things could go real south in a hurry. Yep. But the problem with locks are that your database's performance is now garbage. Yeah, everyone's just said, everyone's trying to use this database all at the same time, and they're just waiting. Like, imagine, imagine if, you have a computer. Imagine if you're if trying, to write, looks a, you're trying to write a comment on a blog post, and you got to wait for everyone else's comment. Yep. You know what it's like? If your database is now boo, and every time you look at him, he stops moving. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're the only one looking at him. Then he'll open his eyes for so you. So an isolated and consistent way to do this, and this is how I, back when I did some database administration, which was before 2008 at this point, so a decade ago, with Postgres, you can set up concurrency and clever locking. So an example would be, every time I start a, a, a select query, the state of, the, of all the tables that I am looking at is almost snapshotted and saved on its own copy. So my query, even if it's long running, can finish against the state of the database as it was when I began my query. If Scott makes updates, he's making them to the real database, but I won't see them because his updates were after I started my select. Mm -hmm. That means Scott can write to the database all he wants while I'm reading, but you can imagine there are ways for that to go south too. Every query makes its own snapshot of all the tables. That can add up in a hurry and cause its own performance problems. Yep. All right, so this brings to another thing, which is, okay, you've got this system that's being used by a zillion people, and we've solved all these problems so they can all use it, but even though we've we sort of made it possible so that the data won't get messed up or anything like that, or no one has to wait, it still takes a lot of computing power to do all this, right? So there's a lot of the things that are features of relational databases are things to just improve performance, and you might not even know they're there, right? Caching, so indices, multiple indices, pre-calculated results tables. Right, so indices are like the most common one, and it's basically an index. is basically a fancy like lookup. That lets, you know, it's the way the data is at, because the data is, in the end, still in a file somewhere on a hard drive, right? Even though it's not a file, it's like a fancy server that's in between you and the file, it's still a file or files, 
right, on hard drives somewhere where the data is. So the index is basically a fancy thing that helps it search the data faster. It's sort of like, okay, imagine, you know, it's sort of like... The like, look at the index of a phone book, and it tells you what page to start looking for a phone number on. Right. It's like, so if I say, you know, select from the table all the, you know, the names that begin with B, it's like, aha, well, the sh I know where to, it doesn't have to look through every single freaking name in the whole million row table. It can do it a lot faster because it has this index files that it built and keeps updated as the data changes so that it can execute the queries faster by referring to these lookups to begin with. Yep. Uh, so another big thing, which is related to what Rim was talking about before, is you know you have so many users, your computer, you know that's running the database is even though it's really not finely tuned, you only have so much CPU, so much RAM. So you want to distribute that shit across a bunch of computers. That's right. You got to get more computers in the mix. You get a one database running on many computers. That way you can get more users. Because you know back in the day, what people would do is they would just get a bigger computer, and that was a strategy. You know why that was the strategy? That was the strategy because Microsoft Windows costs money. If you had Microsoft Windows and MS SQL Server and you wanted to get two computers, you had to buy licenses again, and they weren't cheap. Now, right? like Oracle and people, they link it to CPU cores for their licensing. Right, and, and it's like, well, 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 that's, uh, you know, Oracle also, you had to buy more Oracle. You had to give them more money when you want to get more computers in the mix. Well, guess what? Linux costs zero dollars, right? Postgres and MySQL are free, unless you get the paid MySQL, which you don't want. Yep, and right? Postgres, like, honestly... Postgres like, is better than MySQL, and it's free. I've been using... I use Postgres... Before it was kind of super production ready, Postgres is like the one to use if you don't yeah, know I mean, which one to both use. Both Postgres nowadays. and MySQL are super production ready, but if you're a database nerd, you'll hate MySQL and like Postgres better. But they're big time companies using MySQL super well. Yep. Uh, so the thing is, is basically MySQL is a little bit more user friendly. If you're just setting up a blog, probably just go with that. And then if you're doing anything serious, you better not use MySQL. If you're a bank, don't use MySQL. So in the old days, though, to get back to Scott's distributed model, yep. distributing a database was a giant pain in the ass. Oh, huge pain in the ass. Like, to get a distributed Postgres set up, good God, we ended up it was having... MySQL actually made it a little bit easier before Postgres did, but now Postgres also makes it yeah, easier. Yeah, Postgres has this stuff built in, but you used to, I used to have to do stuff like... Put the binary transaction logs of Postgres on a DRBD volume and have that replicate to another place yeah, yeah, yeah. and have a Postgres, another Postgres running in read-only yeah. mode that happened to also look at that data. Right. It was a mess. So what pe most people do and what's sufficient... Wait till I even tell you what I did for MySQL back then. <laughs> what's sufficient for most applications is to have a master-slave setup. So the way this works is you have one server that runs the database normally. Then what you do is that server, whenever it receives instructions to add data it will send those instructions to other computers also running the same exact database. So, so you go to the, the master and you say, insert a new person into that table. And it does, and then it tells this other computer, hey, insert this person into that table. Okay. But that other one, the slave, right, the, the poorly named slave database, mm -hmm. uh, doesn't accept inserts or updates or data change SQL statements from anyone except that master database. So if you tried to go there and insert, it would say, sorry, I can't insert. I can only select. Yep. So that way, now you can write all your applications to where when they need to read data or select from the database, they make their selects on one of your one or more of your slave databases. And then if they need to insert, they send it to the master. And now all the inserts go to one computer and all the selects go to all these other computers. The, the slaves might fall a little, like a few seconds behind the master one. So you might have some data timing issues. A lot of times you'll have a situation where like you go insert and then immediately select and the thing you just inserted isn't there yet. Uh, uh, that happens a lot. There's clever ways around there that. There are a lot but of clever ways around it. But that's the, out of scope for the show. Yeah, the point is, is that when you have this kind of setup, a lot of selects will actually use a lot of computer horsepower if they're complicated. And you'll be preventing people from inserting when you make those selects. Now... now you have people inserting all day because it's real easy to insert. It's always real easy to insert. It like takes almost no computing power to insert unless you've got stupid indexes that are busted. Yep. Or you've got long-running stored procedures for some reason. Don't do that. 
right? And now people can select freely. And if they tie up a whole computer selecting, no big deal. We got like 100 slaves. You but know? this only solves the problem where you have write few, read many architecture in your actual application. Yep. If, you're, if you have a lot of things all trying to write to the database at the same time, this doesn't help you at all. Uh-oh. And the solutions to that are actually way even more the complicated. Thing is, most applications are write few, read many. That is true. Right? You got a blog. You got some website. How much writing is going on? How often do you update the website with a new blog post once the a day, main right use but i've how seen how often do you read you got a million people coming to read the website a, a use case i've seen though for the situation we have a lot of things writing is usually around disaster recovery failover environments where you want to have a hot hot system yep where your primary and your backups are all hot and can be used as production at the same time yep if any if your master and you know goes the real down, answer is if a slave goes down well you have a hundred computers or however many usually you don't need a hundred i'm just making up a number right yeah. usually it's like master and a couple slaves and that gets you a big that gets you a lot of users when you just have that many uh it's like, oh, one went down. Well, we have a full copy of the database and the same exact software running on all these computers. Just make another one be the yep. master now and fix the master that broke. But I guess what I'll say in terms of that failover disaster recovery thing is that hot cold is real easy to do with relational databases. Yep. Hot warm is actually really easy to do in terms of write access. Yep. Hot hot, where both sides or you know end sides can all be have inserts running at the same time. It's not hard to do anymore in the sense that a lot of databases have functions to do this built in. Like you can, it's, it's a configuration challenge. Mm -hmm. In the old days, it was nigh impossible. The way I did it 20, well, 15 years ago, and you should not do it this way, is I had two MySQL databases. One of them, its, index, its indices were hard-coded to increment as even integers. Mm -hmm. And the other one was hard-coded to increment its rights with its indices, odd-numbered integers. So there could never be a conflict if yep. you wrote to either one, and they both had binary transaction logs pointed at each other. Mm -hmm. Do not do that. <laughs> no. So uh, that does remind me, there is the thing that's very popular these days when you get really massive, which is called sharding. And what, uh, you, what, you, do, what you do with sharding right? is like, okay. Just so like in MMOs, actually. <laughs> Right, well, right. Sharding is sort of what MMOs do. Yeah, it's yep. like, okay, well, we've got this huge database, but you know, it has like all the names of all our users. But you know what? We don't really often have to search through all the users. Most of the time, we're only searching through a subset of the users divided by, say, region, right? They've got the U.S. office is only really searching the U.S. users, and the Europe office is only searching the Europe users. So you know what? Well, it'll still be the same. We still want to combine everything because occasionally we do want to just search everything. But most of the time, we're like 90% of the time, we're only searching one section, right? So what we'll do is we'll take the database and we'll chop it up, well, even though it's the same table, we'll put all the U.S. users on this server, the Europe users on that server, or you know, you might how you divide it depends on your application, right? You divide by you know region, you could divide by alphabetical, you, uh, could, you could divide by all sorts of things, whatever makes sense. For so you. I ran into a if problem. You're, if you're once. writing, say, a website like Reddit, you might divide by subreddit. So like, oh, all the data for this subreddit, all the comments, all this stuff is in this database server, and all this other subreddit is on this other database. So server. I ran into a problem once with sharding, or it was a we were doing. Effectively sharding. This was back two jobs ago. Right, but now all the queries related to one subset of your application go to the same place, and now you can balance the load. There's a really popular subreddit. Well, it gets its own database server. Yep. All these unpopular ones, we can all cluster them together on the same server. Right? So we sharded market data, like market data from the stock market, based on... The alphabet, like the letter that right. the ticker started with. Right. So all this, all the stocks that begin with A are on yep. the server. All the ones that begin with B are on the yeah. That was fine, except that S was a problem. Yeah, no, you just that's what I'm saying. You got to give two servers to S, and yep. you probably can put Q, Z, and whatever all on the same server together. Yep, but yeah. uh, sharding requires you to analyze and understand the usage patterns of your database. And this is why you have that person at your company who is the database person. There's they, a reason why you can get a degree in database right. administration. That person, if you t if they do they'll just know to do some sharding they'll know to optimize some indexes they do all these things on the database server and all the people using the database don't even know that any of this is going on all they're doing is connecting and typing sql and the results always come back and they don't know any of this stuff happened because there's this abstraction layer going on right and but meanwhile you can have so many more users so much more reliable data so much more safety for the data nothing will happen to it it'll always be safe and all these great things happen completely behind the scenes so and that's why people use databases. I spent a decade and not in Excel administering databases in the course of my work, and I'm glad to never do that again. <laughs> uh, 
I will share an anecdote from when I went to RIT. Mm-hmm. I was a pre-freshman, and I had to decide what major. Like, am I going to do IT, or am I going to do computer science, or all these things? And even within IT, now they've changed it. They've split it out more. But IT had all these different concentrations. And one of the things you could focus on in IT was database administration. And the way database administration, because IT, you had to take classes in every discipline. And then from there, you'd pick a few specialties. So we had took our initial classes on like database administration. And they told us in every one of these classes, if you specialize in database administration, you will make a shit ton of money immediately out of college. And I heard that. I, I understood that. I took my database classes and I said, that ain't worth it. And I didn't want that money. So, I don't know if you necessarily want to be a database administrator because you will be a database administrator forever if you get really good at it. Right. A lot of people who like were previously data uh, database administrators are now like calling themselves things like data scientist or you know things like that. They do not want to optimize your Postgres database. Right. Like you know this or like you know information something something right or like all these kinds of other you know adjacent yep. you know um or like you know they be like they're trying to you know be like oh be like a machine learning person they're trying to move away from you know I'm I'm an information manager or something right but you know? counterpoint unlike a lot of things if you want if you want to learn database administration and you can't afford to go to college databases are some of the most well documented things there are and free yeah, you can download Postgres, run it on a Linux box a at home. professional enterprise quality level database. The that documentation is, that's free and free online. documentation. Is super detailed, super good. You can just become a Postgres master all on your own and then easily make jobs and money. I think you could learn database administration on your own on the internet for free easier than you can learn most programming. Yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah. Just the resources are more consistent. SQL is is pretty solid I think at this the point. The hard part really is learning just the fundamental concepts. Yeah. And not because the documentation is mostly going to tell you like here's this command, here's what it does and you might not understand all the language in the documentation. Yeah. Begin insert not, blah or blah equals foo. Insert foo. Commit. Right. You might need to get like a, a book with an animal on it to talk about, you know, the the general like, you know, uh scope of things and but you can and literally the vocabulary and then everything else will be easy but i guess the experimentation and like the practical knowledge is way easy to learn because kind of like a python interpreter you can literally just log into your database from the command line and start asking it questions there's also tons of free gui tools you can use to look at your database like it's a spreadsheet so yep. you don't have to even learn how to use uh you know the, the command line right you can just use the gui and type your stuff in there my real advice to you is don't use a NoSQL solution unless you understand no why. One uses those. They're pretty much dead. Unless you understand way. why you can't use an ACID compliant real relational database. Right. You'd be surprised. Like it, the, the relational databases, the SQL databases are so flexible. You know that it's like almost every application out there can is like can use one. Well, the worst case is when you see people implement a non-relational database and then it, over the course of building their thing end up reinventing ACID. Right, it's like reinventing you, acid is like a thing that people do. It's like using, you know, sometimes people use UDP instead of TCP because they need the performance. And then they re-implement but, TCP. Right, and they re-implement TCP. <laughs> Only do it if you're re-implementing part of TCP, not all of TCP. If you re-implemented all of TCP in UDP, you should have just used TCP to begin with. Yep. Only if your UDP is it, your if your you know layers on UDP have made it so slow that it's not faster, you wasted your time. Right. So, yeah, but, it, you know, if you're making any software at all and you suddenly d- realize I need a place to store all this data and I might want to search it, just pick a relational database, use SQLite if you only if it's a local one-person application and use MySQL or Postgres if it's a multi-person application that has a server and just start from there and only change if you absolutely have to and you're smart enough to realize it's not working. All right, I think we're done. Okay, good. That was easy. Record the Patreon thing really bit. I'll just do it on the stream for once. And the Patreon patrons for this episode of Geek Nights are 
Craig Oliver, Alan Joyce, Rebecca Dunn, Heidi Lee Nicholas, Shimmering Ruby Abelez, Hanging in the Sky, Kajar Tavishin, MyStady.com, Jeremy Miner, Linkiji, Roberto Kingsley, Kelly Stoddard, Cold Guy, Amanda Duchette, Sean Yeager, Matthew Smith, Nicholas Brandon, Mr. Strong Stretching, 421 Creations, No, I Never Ever Wonder Why We're Here, Semper Five, Bitch, Sherman Von Horrell, Rory, James David Wright, R White, Rochelle Montanona, Superboy, Tripwire, Sailor Vista, Don Schleich, Joe Shiro Driftstar, Clinton Walton, Run for New Zealand, Ryan Perrin, Drew Openlander, Finn, Chris Midkiff, Daniel Redmond, Sean Klein, Chris Reimer, and Thomas Hahn. And now I leave you with...